All right, I'm Tom Fisher. It's bourbonblog.com. And you know, whiskey making, it's it's a bit of a dirty job itself. It takes more time, more effort than we might realize. But at the end of the day, sipping a glass of whiskey can make the job just a little bit easier. So it's no surprise, the very talented Micro has ventured into the world of whiskey with his own brand, Noble Tennessee Whiskey. It's my pleasure today to welcome to the show Mike Rowe, it's great to have you here, my friend. Tom, it's great to be had. I just happen to have a bottle close by in case of emergencies. Why take I, chances? I've, I've, oh, you know, I think it's always, I have a few whiskeys around here. It's always good. You, have, so you haven't team. had any. <laughs> that's right. To the team, it's, uh, you haven't had any too many emergencies you need whiskey for lately, or have you? Um, I think rather than frame it like that, I would say that my life for the last 20 years has been one constant, ongoing, perpetual, chronic, never-ending emergency. Right. And, uh, you know, what you said before was funny. Like, at the end of a long day, after a dirty job, you sit down, you have a civilized snort. That uh, That's never been more true than it's been now. Although, I did learn something back in season four, I guess it was. I was in a rum distillery. Yes somewhere up in I was like Rhode Island maybe right, right. and um the guys <laughs> you know when, when you make rum you get you basically sip it all day long to see how you're doing um along the process and they they explained that there was something called a uh, I think it was called the Steinhardt privilege which made it legal in Germany or wherever you made rum right. in the old days to you know to essentially drink during work so my crew and I fully embrace the Steinhardt privilege uh, and continue to do so to this day. And you can take it and even not only on the rum distiller episode, because I was that's cool. I actually I remember that one. But you do you did you have you done it on some other episodes we might not have even known in the background? Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, we were uh, I mean, there's no absolutely no rule that requires the job be focused on the making of whiskey in order to enjoy a civilized and responsible dram. Uh, during the inevitable uh, lunch period. <laughs> right. Well, I have I have one close to me. It looks like it's it's possible whiskey is in your cup too. Maybe it's possible. It's possible. Uh, it's, it's actually yeah yeah. It's, it's it's a little coffee. It's a little whiskey. It's a you coffee. know little whiskey. And then this is a Tennessee whiskey uh, called Noble whiskey. Um, I suppose you've how, how long have you been a fan of whiskey? You've been a fan of whiskey for a long time. As long as I was. Well, I was going to say as long as I've been old enough, but that's not entirely true. I've I've been a fan of whiskey most of my life. Um, you know, I grew up around it. My family aren't uh, are big drinkers necessarily, but I, uh, you know, I always equated it with a hard day's work, and I'm right. certainly not the first person to have done that. So, right. when when dirty jobs began, you know, I mean, if you want the short version of the whole story, that that show was dedicated to a guy named Carl Noble, who was my next door neighbor who happened to be my granddad. And he was one of those guys. If you've seen my show, you'll know the guy. He's, you know, he didn't go through, didn't go to college. In fact, my pop only went to the seventh grade, but by the time he was 30, he was a, he was a, a master electrician, a steam fitter, a pipe fitter, a welder. It built the house I was born in without a blueprint. You know, he was that guy. So Dirty Jobs was a tribute to him. And when the show took off uh, and my pop died, his name kind of died with him. He only had girls, you know. And um, and later when I started my foundation and then much later when Dirty Jobs came back during the lockdowns, I thought, you know, it'd be cool to celebrate the return of the show with a shout out to my pop. So Noble, uh, K-N-O-B-E-L, uh, is a nod of the hat to him. Started as a fundraiser for the foundation. And it's been about a year and a half now, and uh, the receipts are in, as they say, and people seem to dig it. So I'm going to stick with it. I love that. I love what you're doing with the whiskey. Of course, you have uh, Microworks, uh, your foundation. This is was partly to help raise funds for your foundation in the beginning, right? Correct. We, Yeah, we give away... I mean, the foundation itself, just so your listeners know, is it started as a PR campaign for a few million good jobs right. that people really struggle to fill, you know, these are not jobs that require a four year degree. They require training. They require, uh, you know, a, a certain kind of competency and, um, so forth. So we give away about a million bucks a year, sometimes more in, uh, in a work ethic scholarship 
program. And I spend a fair amount of time over the course of the year doing all kinds of goofy stuff to raise money uh, for that initiative. And I just thought, well, you know, I don't mind putting the profits of the online sales back into the foundation and then saving whatever we we make on the shelf and and putting that back into the business. So as you know, you know, like you read a lot of stories about people who make a ton of money selling whiskey. In in my experience, it's like anything else. There's no shortcut. You got to work. You have to work. Yeah. And this was, uh, I love the fact that this is how the brand began was to, in order to raise funds for uh, young people and what they're doing. And, and you're such an advocate of, um, of those young people as a former teacher myself. Uh, you know, it's, it's awesome to see what you're doing. Thanks. And I put the website right there so people can, uh, can check it out. And, uh, the whiskey itself, tell us a little bit about, uh, the whiskey itself. The work well, it out. was honestly, it was never a thing I seriously considered. There was a while where I came really close to launching a micro, micro brew just because I thought it sounded terribly clever. Um, and and really, you know, I know a lot of craft brewers. And I know a lot of the big guys. And it it very nearly happened. And it probably would have, but for uh, my partner, Mary, who had a friend in the wholesale part of the business. And through a complicated series of happenstances during the lockdowns, right. basically what happened was I got a line on some really good juice that had been in the barrel for about five years oh. down in Tennessee. Yeah. And, you know, I'm, I'm pretty leery of label slaps. And frankly, I don't think what the country is hurting for right now is another B list celebrity with his granddad's name on a bottle of bourbon. Right. So I, I, I wasn't super anxious, right. but I was going to be in Nashville anyhow. So I stopped by and I tasted it. And as my grandfather would say, I damn near swallowed my tongue. I just couldn't believe. I I figured it'd be decent. I didn't know it would be great. So that's that's how it started. I said, look, I'll take whatever you got. Uh, this is the label we, we put on it. Um, this is actually the second iteration. This is the Rick House edition. Right. First, right. Stuff, first stuff sold out in like four days. It was gone. And you know, we had some momentum and we raised some money for the foundation. So I, I went back to the distiller and I said, look, is there, is there anything close to this that we could keep the party going with? And they said, well, this stuff, this Rick house, it's a little younger. It's like three, three and a half years, but it's been finished in these French Oak staves Amazing. and, and you should try it. And I swear to God, Tom, I, I thought it was better than the original. So we like doubled down we got a big tranche of that sold out. And ever since I've been trying to figure out this crazy three tier system, um, the, the fundraising component has gone really well. We're in seven or eight States now, and right. we've got a plan and we should be in 20 or 25 uh, oh, by man. the end of this year. So, you know, crawl, walk, run it's baby steps. And, um, we're having a lot of fun along the way, meeting some super cool people. And, uh, you know, Forrest Gumping my way through another weird business. Yeah. And that's the, uh, I put up the website, noblespirits.com is where you go. The Rick House edition is, there still are, is some of that left to buy on the website. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. In fact, there's all kinds of stuff on the site now. I I signed like a thousand of these bottles last time I was down there. And I, those are probably gone at this point. But the Rick House is a uh, 95 uh, proof and it is a little younger than the original, which is a 90 proof, actually. Um, opinions vary as to who likes what more, but they're they're both available right now. Anything purchased online helps the MicroWorks Foundation. And, of course, the retail stuff is another story. But it all tastes pretty great, no matter where you get it, bias aside. I noticed that you're calling this the company Noble Spirits. Have you considered doing other spirits other than whiskey or Maybe other maybe other expressions to come, right? Well, yes and no. It's like I I I always try and plan for the eventuality that something better than you expect might happen, since that has seemed to be the case, been the case in a lot of my life. I don't have a big bold design, but but I do like the business and and I like the people I'm in business with. And mostly what I what I really love, Tom, 
I mean, I got so lucky with Dirty Jobs and the fact that that show has been on the air three times a week, every week for 20 years Amazing. is is super weird. But the yeah. the biggest compliment and the thing that I that I feel best about, aside from doing a show that I think my my pop would have approved of, is uh, is the comments I get from fans who say, "Look, if if we ever run into each other in a bar, can we just sit down and have a drink and just you know shoot the crap Shadow for a half hour?" Right. And so it was back to what you said before. There's there's such a relationship between honest hard work and and a sensible snort at the end of the day. And that's honestly how I've been marketing this. Like, I haven't done much. I just really wanted to see if the stuff spoke for itself. But what I have done is, is go to states where it's available, meet the liquor store owners, who by and large are some of the most interesting people you're ever going to want to know. Yeah. You know, they're super knowledgeable about the business, but they're also entrepreneurs at heart. And, you know, they're in a knife fight in a phone booth. It's a tough business. Oh, yeah. And I just stop in, I shake hands, I thank them for trying it. I sign their bottles, they hop on their social, and 40, 50, 100 people come by, and we're suddenly having a party in a little hole in the wall liquor store in a strip mall somewhere in Lexington, right? So, right. so it's really been fun to, uh, to tell the story in that way. And, Again, I, I don't really know what I'm doing. I'm forest gumping my way through this whole thing, but we're learning as we go, and it's been really gratifying to uh, not just meet fans of the show, but share a drink with them and a couple of uh, war stories. And this is what brings us together uh, as, a, as a culture uh, to, balance, to balance that work schedule out, to balance the end of the day. And, and you know what? It's our history. Yeah. You know, there, there, it's a, it's a pretty divided time that we're living in right now. And people, yeah. you know, there's just no end to things people can get pissed off about, but there are a couple of things that still unite us, you know, the, the definition of a good job, the nobility of work, you know, where our food comes from, where our energy comes from right. and where we come from. You know, one of my favorite shows uh, that I was able to work on over the years was a, a series of specials I did at Discovery about 10 years ago called how booze built America. Yes. Right. And it was just a really fun look at the impact that liquor or the absence of liquor, right. <laughs> Prohibition, like so many things that have been integral to the way our country became the country we are, uh, were impacted by the presence of booze. And so, you know, if you can find a, a way to make history fun, right no matter what that is then um well then you're going to win and and using booze to look at the truth of our country uh that's been that's been a real privilege too yes and i know that on your uh, on your podcast uh the way i heard it podcast that you've been doing now for several years you've yeah, won a lot of awards on this uh you've been doing it since is it 16 what about 16 well yeah that's about right i started I started writing, um, you'll remember Paul Harvey Jr. Oh, yeah. Paul Harvey, right? Good day. Yeah. His, uh, his radio show, man, I, I just love that growing up. It was called The Rest of the Story. Yes. And I remember we had a transistor radio up in the wood pile, and my dad and I would be chopping wood and listening to Paul Harvey tell these, these short mysteries, you know, a chance to learn something you you didn't know about somebody you do and figure out who he's talking about along the way. I started writing my version of those in 2016, mostly on planes just to pass the time. Right. And then I started reading them on my podcast. And uh, I didn't think much about it. I, I wasn't even sure what the podcast business was, really. It's like I brought the same level of understanding and knowledge to that as I did to the booze business. I just kind of figured it out as I went. But somebody called me one day and said, hey, um, you got a million people listening to this thing every week. You should like maybe take it seriously. So I wrote some more stories and then some more after that. Those stories turned into a book. That book turned into a TV show called The Story Behind the Story. Right. And today the podcast still features uh, a, a lot of those uh, short stories, but it's also conversations with people who I think you should know, you know, people yeah. I've met 
along this weird crooked path who have a uh, who have a take that I think is worth sharing. And dude, I don't know what to tell you, man. It's people listen. It's um some I, I, my producer called yesterday and said, Mike, there are three million podcasts out there right now. We're number sixty eight. We're gonna have to keep doing it. So well done, man. We'll keep doing it. You know? Keep doing it. Keep telling. You just passed uh, three hundred episodes. I saw. Yeah, we did. Just finished uh, three hundred and three uh, yesterday. And uh, well, you know how it goes. You're doing a podcast. It's yeah. it, it's it's such a it's such a weird mix of things. Some days the conversations go by like that, and you, and you're just having a ball. And then some days you go, God, this is like a barking dog in the backyard. I I toss it a piece of meat. It chews it. It swallows it. And it starts barking again. <laughs> it's, it just never stops. So, you know, not I, complaining. I do get that. I, do, I get some of those elements of Paul Harvey from from listening to some of your podcasts, and really just uh, you know a commentary on what's going on not only in America uh, but in the world. I mean, it is a really divided time. It's a really uh, interesting time. You you offer some hope. You offer some ideas. What do you think he would say right now about all that's happening? <laughs> Paul Harvey, well, he would be very clear about what he thought was good and bad. That's the thing you could always count on from from him. He didn't he didn't pull any punches. He had a way of making his opinions really clear without alienating the other side or upsetting people in the middle. Right. And the way he did it typically was he balanced it. He'd be very candid in certain areas, but he'd also give you the straight news in other areas. And then he'd do this thing called news and commentary in other areas where you just learn, like he'd devote five minutes to some little town you couldn't find on a map to tell the story of some person you had never heard of who had done some decent thing. And in a very, very, very small way, um, you know, he was able to magnify and amplify those stories. And he wasn't alone, Tom, you know, when, when Paul Harvey was doing that, Charles Kuralt was yeah, doing it in yeah. a slightly different way. And and George Plimpton in a slightly different way. And Studs Terkel in a, in a, in a slightly different way. And these guys, they're, they're all gone now. And in no way am I suggesting I can fill their shoes, but I can I can follow in their footsteps, you know. Sure, sure. And, and that's what Dirty Jobs has tried to do. That's what my podcast tries to do. Honestly, when I think about it, every show I've worked on, from How Booze Built America to Dirty Jobs to Somebody's Got to Do It to Returning the Favor to Six Degrees, it's just, it's me tapping the country on the shoulder and saying, hey, what about him? What about her? Get right. a load of that. Yeah. And then just moving on, having a sensible snort at the end of the day. <laughs> having that snort. <laughs> you know, it's... Yeah. I mean, I, I think I think sometimes that if there's a key to doing anything, it's to do everything, right? It's just to push the boulder up the hill, tilt at the windmill, and 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 keep as many balls in the air as you can, just because it's fun to watch. Yeah, no, and 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 I love that you've done that. You've told those stories, which we. Uh... Otherwise, wouldn't have, uh, have have heard, and you continue to with uh, with six degrees. Six degrees. I mean, we only did six episodes, and we yeah. did them during the lockdowns. Yeah, and um, it's really an example of what I was saying before in terms right. of trying trying to make history accessible to right. people who otherwise wouldn't give a damn. My dad was a history teacher uh, most of his life, and in the same way, Dirty Jobs was a tribute uh, to my granddad. Six Degrees was a tribute to my dad. So, like, we would tell the story, for instance, of how a horseshoe can help you find your soulmate. And we would walk you through the events in history that led to the creation of the horseshoe and how that eventually led to a series of events that ultimately got you to the Internet and how yeah. the Internet ultimately got you to Match.com and eHarmony <laughs> and Grinder and... And all of them. All of those, right. Right. And so it's 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 showing people that through a series of seemingly disparate and impossible to connect events, you can, in fact, draw a pretty straight line. And when you do that, you 
essentially remind people that we're all connected in ways that it's really easy to forget. So that show, interestingly, was was sponsored almost entirely by the energy industry because the energy industry wants to be a part of reminding people of, oh, hey, right, this is this is kind of what's keeping the train on the tracks. Well, it's not so much different than than booze either, right? It's it's these it's these things that often get pilloried as vices that wind up being the things that keep us more connected than anything else. And that's what makes the shows fun. Oh, absolutely. Oh, would, will we be seeing any more in the future of any six degrees type of shows? Could could happen? Maybe, but I, I'll be honest. And this, is, this sounds like such a yeah. douchey thing to say, but yeah. I'm like my time is not my own right now. I don't. I mean, we just finished the last season of Dirty Jobs. Right. There'll probably be more. Yes. Uh, Fox Business just ordered another season of How America Works, uh, and that's going to be busy. The story behind the story is in season four now on TBN. The podcast is the aforementioned Barking Dog. The line of whiskey is a thing that I am taking seriously. And the foundation, look, your your listeners should know, and they're welcome to apply for a work ethic scholarship yeah. or spread the word. Because, I mean, literally, we raised uh, another two million bucks this year, and it's burning a hole in my pocket. And I'm going to try and give most of it away in March and April. Is there a, perhaps a, a greater a story of um, of the whiskey making process that that maybe that, that you've been a part of and that you've seen happen that you'd like to uh, again revisit with uh, like you did with the rum distillery? Mm. So. Well, you know it's funny. I, I hadn't really thought about it, but when I look back at the first season of of Dirty Jobs, one of the first places I went was a it was a brewery somewhere in New England. It was called Long Long Trail Ale, and I think a lauder ton was the what one of the first really ridiculously hot, humid, cramped spaces into which I crawled on dirty jobs. And so we've since been to a couple of different breweries. It's probably time to go back and and take a deep dive into the distilling business. And forgive me, but if I do it, I'm pretty sure it's it's going to be a close look at how we make noble. <laughs> How you make noble? No, that's all right. Show, show how that noble is uh, is made. Do, but I, I, but you know what though? I mean, yep. it, of course we'd go to the distillery, and of sure. course we would talk to the people who were on the front line of it. But more importantly, we'd go to the farms. Sure, we we'd meet the people who are growing the corn, growing the rye, right. growing the barley. We would really try and get an understanding of where the story starts. Because that's that's always the trick, right? It's like you have to know where your story starts. You know, it's it, it's really important to know where it ends, but mostly you don't have a choice with that. The story ends where it ends, but we get to decide where it starts. And so, on Dirty Jobs and on a lot of these other shows, I I try and walk it back because I'll never forget there was a miner. I met a coal miner in 2004, who said to me on camera, one of the greatest things I ever heard, he said, Mike, you know, there, there are lots of jobs out there, but there are only two industries. There's agriculture and there's mining. Every single thing in your office right there and in mine right. yeah. either grew from the ground and was fashioned into something useful or consumed, or we pulled it from the ground and fashioned it into the, you know, into glass or steel. It's like, that's primal. And when you start thinking about work and business and play, you know, when you start to work it back to the place where its logical origin truly resides, then you're just going to wind up writing a series of love letters to farmers and miners again and again, over and over. And as you mentioned glass, I'm glad you mentioned that so many distilleries do really care about where their glass is made, uh, where the glass, the corks, all of these things uh, do go back somehow into uh, an origin that we don't always think about as uh, as whiskey drinkers. Yeah, it's a symphony of things. And when they all play together at the same time in the right way, it's beautiful. But, you know, I launched this brand at the height of the lockdowns. And so, you know... I've got juice in barrels 
in Tennessee. I've got glass coming from another factory on the other, some other port in California. Sure, sure. I got corks coming from God knows where. I got labels coming from who knows where. All of it's got to get on a truck or a ship. Somehow. And somehow get to the same place where the real fun begins, right? And the states get involved and the liquor boards and the tax bureaus and so forth and so on. And so, you know, one of the first things I did when I <laughs> tried to launch this thing was find a way to good naturedly complain about the broken supply chain because it impacted everything. And I actually rewrote a song. It was a song called The Nobleman uh, that I made up that was based on the Wellerman that was making the rounds on TikTok and all the social media. So what, it was one of these old sea chanties. So I changed the words to say, soon may the nobleman come to bring a bottle for everyone. One day when the waiting is done, we'll take our drink and go. Like uh, it. And it was really just an homage to a busted supply chain. And so that stupid thing went viral and that helped us get on the map. Moral of the story, of course, being it's never, ever, ever as easy as you think. And anything worth doing is going to require and demand a lot of other seemingly disparate things get done somehow. As you've been at this in the whiskey business in the last few years, do you, do you find yourself trying a lot of other whiskeys, visiting other distilleries? Do you? I do. How, how are you diving in? <laughs> well, it's it, it's a great question, Tom, because there's just so much nonsense in the business and there's yeah. just so much label slapping going on. And I've really, I've, I've made a promise to myself and everybody I'm in business with to not to not do that. God bless Matthew McConaughey. I'm, he's a wonderful guy and I don't doubt anything he's told me, but you know, there's a lot of pressure in this business to tell the story about the vision quest and how I've always wanted to do this and how I finally sat down with growers and experts and went through all of the machinations to come up with just the right, that, that's not how it happened for me. You know, I knew a guy who knew a guy and th through circumstances too weird to relate i got access to something that i didn't think i otherwise could and then i just decided to do it so that's my story you know the honest story is it really is like dirty jobs and micro works a love letter to my pop and i wouldn't put his name on something if i didn't think it was better than decent so that's where i am and yes to answer your question i'm talking with all sorts of people who are way smarter than me in the business and just hanging on for dear life. I just got back from Nashville where I talked to some oh, guys who, like you, had right. that many bottles times a thousand. And they they just they can hold forth, they can weigh in for hours, and they're they're true aficionados, true experts on the craft. Um, uh, one day I'll be smarter than I am now, but at the moment, I'm just hanging on for dear life. Day by day, sip by sip, we're we're all always learning. Congratulations on this, Mike, and everything you've done, not only with your, your foundation, your shows, your whiskey, just all that you do. Uh, what a cool thing it is to have you on Bourbon Blog. And thanks, everybody, for uh, for watching and, and for, for your comments below. Uh, look forward to hopefully having a whiskey with you soon, Mike. Uh, you know, say the word. This Zoom thing is fine, but <laughs> it's really no substitute for sitting down and, uh, and doing it in person. Sooner the better. Absolutely. Cheers, my friend. Thanks so much. Thank you, Tom.